The next presenter is Sophie Blackall. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Um, my introducer person is not here yet, so I have a very good friend, Susanna Richards, who is a children's literature professor. She's an extraordinary person, and she once said, I would do anything for you. So I have forced her to come up, and she's going to introduce me spur of the moment, just like she needs an introduction. I'm so delighted that you're gonna to get to hear two-time Caldecott Award-winning Sophie Blackall, the 2019 winner of the Caldecott Medal, which she received in Washington, D.C. this summer. And so she's gonna hear, and so for Hello Lighthouse, and also, many of you may remember, Finding Winnie, her 2016 <laughs> Caldecott book. And you're gonna be delighted to listen to her and have a lot of fun, Sophie. Thank you, Susanna. All right, can you hear me if I walk around over here? Can you hear me at the back? Excellent. At the back, you might not know, but there are really cozy bean bags. They've got it sorted down here. They're in the good land down here. Um, thank you, Susanna, for that introduction. I'm Australian, so I can never say anything you know, like that, so I need somebody else to do it. Um, Oh, I don't have my... Oh, we do have pictures over there. Excellent. Uh, this, is, this is me, age seven. And I could never have imagined, age seven, that I would be standing here in Washington, D.C., talking to you all at the National Book Festival. Thank you to the Library of Congress for organizing this festival, for having me here. Thank you to the thousands of volunteers who make this happen, to the interpreters who are doing such a stellar job all day long. I'm thrilled to be here. So, when I was seven, I grew up in Australia, which looks, now I'm not working, which looks like this, horrible, right? Imagine why I wanted to leave that. Uh, and I spent most of my childhood in a tree in the Nah, I'm going to have to do this. Uh, in the bush, in a tree, uh, escaping my mother, who wanted me to do chores, clean my room, wash dishes, and I wanted to read in a tree. My brother was also in a tree. His tree was better because he was older, but mine was squigglier. We spent most of our waking hours with books in the tree. We had a rope strung between them with a basket so we could exchange books when we ran out of stories. We were extremely competitive and had survival kits in our trees. These were some of the things in our survival kits. I had a refresher towelette that my father brought back from a plane, which was a very important thing because you never knew when you might need refreshing. I had one of those things of safety pins all attached to another safety pin because in an emergency, a safety pin could save you. Uh, my brother, though, had a pen knife because he was older, which was so unfair. And I thought he had totally won until I found that rusty camp set of utensils that clicked together. Then I was definitely in the lead. So we had this whole survival thing in our tree with our books. But sooner or later, we would need food. And in Australia, there's this incredibly inedible, uh, dusty, dry, it's, it's a cookie, but it's nothing like a cookie, which is why it's called a biscuit. And it looks like this inside. It's just, it's just awful. But it's sort of like hard tack that they would give sailors. And we would gnaw on these bush biscuits for, for hours. Um, this, this looked to me a little bit like Australia, which I think was wishful um, thinking. But um, I'm clearly a little bit homesick, and I can't believe I just wasted three slides on bush biscuits. Um, uh, anyway, it felt a little bit like being in a lighthouse up a tree, except we weren't doing anything useful, like saving ships from being wrecked or, or you know, guiding people to shore. We were just being selfish and not doing our jobs. But there were similarities, being in a remote place, uh, having to wait for the tender, or in our case, our mother, to bring us supplies. Fast forward many years later, and I started making picture books. And I've made 45 of them, and some of the, not all picture books, but some of them you might know. And some of you might know Ivy Bean. Excellent. And Finding Winnie. 
And the question I get asked more than any other is, where do you get your ideas to make drawings, to make books? And the first answer is really from other books. I love books. I love reading. You will hear this again and again and again today. Every writer is first a reader. I also love other things like ducks, especially if I can catch them and cuddle them. They can tell me their jokes. Ducks are hilarious. Uh, I like sad, flat meringue babies. I just want to draw your attention to the one in the foreground who is the most chipper of all of the sad, flat meringue babies. Even though he has lost his foot, he's just, oh, pick me, pick me. I just saw this in a window in a cake shop in Rome. And I thought, maybe one day this will be a story, I don't know. I put all of these things into a well of ideas. I love pigs, especially when they look like their owners. Uh, this is my cat. Some of you may have a cat. I would bet, I would put money on it that your cat is the kind of cat that you can pick up and it purrs and you can stroke your cat. When you come home from school, it might run and leap into your arms. Perhaps you can wear it as a shawl, not this cat. This cat is what I call a negative cat. I like maps, especially if they have sea monsters. I am always wanting to sit in the window seat of a plane because that's where you see everything. I like vending machines in other countries. I can understand why people need things after hours. Spam, sure, playing cards, maybe. I still don't need, know why anyone would need a Little Mermaid money kin uh, after hours, but who knows? In Italy, anything can happen. But most of my ideas I get from children, and luckily for me, I spend a lot of time with them. I work with Save the Children and UNICEF, and I get to travel to countries like Bhutan, where I meet children in their schools, we share stories and draw pictures. Children in Congo, in India, and in Rwanda. These are children reading the very first book they have ever read in their lives. They are opening the book and turning the pages and looking at the pictures and making out the words for the first time. And it was humbling and thrilling to be there. I love drawing with children. It's always unexpected. They always make my drawings better. <laughs> but mostly it's better just to stand back and let them alone. I asked kids to draw me visitors from outer space because that's what my next book is about. And they drew them and then I helped them turn them into designs in cut paper. And I would be proud to have made any one of these. So all of those ideas I put into my well, sometimes they stay there forever, sometimes I fish them out after a while. Many years ago, I found this cutout etching at a flea market, and I saw it, and for the first time I started to think about life inside a lighthouse, and I thought, what can I do with this? I could maybe make a book, but the time wasn't right, so I put it in the well. But years later, it came out again, and it became this book. Hello Lighthouse is an ode to a lighthouse. It's a story about a new keeper who comes to replace the old. He experiences all the different kinds of weather. He experiences loneliness and separation. He experiences storms and the joyful reunion with his wife and fog and shipwrecks and carpets of ice. He experiences illness and near death, and then the joy of recovery. His wife has a child. There's this extraordinary explosion of joy that that brings. And then there is the change that came to all lighthouses when they became automated. And life as they knew it would be different forevermore. This book has been uh, an extraordinary experience sharing it out in the world. Um, I've learned things that children have pointed out to me that I intuitively probably knew I was doing, but it took a child to show me that this 
picture at the end of the book. A parent told me this story that, that she was reading it with her child and she said to the child, it's sad, isn't it? This, this life of theirs is over. Um, they're looking back at the lighthouse. They were so happy there and now they can't go back. They have to move forward, but it's sad. And the child said, not really, because after they've finished saying goodbye to the lighthouse, which is also kind of hello from a different place, they're going to close the door and go up the stairs, and behind their house is the rest of the world. And I thought, oh, kids are smart. Thank goodness we have them to tell them, tell us what our books are about. I've realized that a lot of people like lighthouses for all different reasons. In the 19th century, they would pile themselves into towers for photographs with them. You can find lighthouses on everything from salt and pepper shakers to these weird crochet things, whatever they are, to um, people who actually even want to be a lighthouse. And I think the reasons people like lighthouses are, are varied. People see them as symbols something to guide us, something that is constant and steadfast. This is Minot's Ledge Lighthouse in Massachusetts. It's often called the I Love You Lighthouse because its signal is one flash, four flashes, and then three flashes. This is one of the reasons I love lighthouses. This is what Minot's Ledge looks like when the sea is calm. And this is what it looks like in a storm. And can you imagine being inside that lighthouse when a wave hits the reef and turns itself inside out and slams against the wall of the lighthouse like a wrecking ball? And you are inside, all cozy in your round room with your cup of tea and your supper. And it's this contrast that I found so compelling about lighthouses. In my research, I had to obviously go and stay in a lighthouse, and I chose this one in Newfoundland, in Canada, on a tiny island in the most northern tip. It's famous for its whales and its icebergs. There was also a family of foxes living on the island. There was a hut with a big glass window where you could look out at the icebergs and the whales. That is a, a whale vertebra, that round thing in the window. And this is where I wrote the first of 12 drafts of Hello Lighthouse. It was when I was staying in the lighthouse that I noticed in five days there that we experienced all different kinds of weather. There was a day when the sky was blue and the sea was turquoise. There was a day where it was still and gray and the sea was silvery like a mirror. And there was a day where the sky was roiling with thunderclouds and the sea was black and churning. But the lighthouse was always the same, constant, steadfast, in the same place. And so as I started to think about the form of this book, I decided the lighthouse would always be in the same place on alternate pages. We would tell the story of the outside world of weather and seasons and storms, and the inside world of the lighthouse keeper and his family would be in circles in the round rooms of the house the circles and cycles of life. So I had my structure ready, I'd written my manuscript, I'd done my research, it was time to turn it into a book. This is a little paper book we call a dummy, which is a practice book so you can see how the pages work together, and maybe you recognize some of those paintings in these early sketches. The dummy done, this is the fun part for me, the painting part. I used Chinese ink, has anyone used Chinese ink before? The big black rectangle is a stone, and the skinny rectangle is the ink stick. You dip it in water and grind it on the stone, and it makes a paint. And I'm gonna show you a sped up practice painting of a lighthouse. That's the Chinese ink that goes on first, all the shadows, the stuff in black and white. And you can see where the black dots are pooling. That's a piece of film. It's like plastic film that's sticky on one side and you can cut out shapes to keep the paper white underneath where you want it to go. If you look very closely, you'll see me peel it off at one point. It's coming up soon. There it was.
I said before that one of the amazing things has been showing this book to people around the world. I went to Maine in the spring. I'd never been to Maine before. And I worked with an organization called Reading, uh, Island Readers and Writers. And we visited tiny islands in Maine. Uh, and there are a lot of them. And they have lighthouses. And these are tiny schools with maybe five kids. And they are underserved schools. They don't have many resources. But each kid gets a book. And we went out on little boats. And these are kids whose grandparents were lighthouse keepers or worked in the Coast Guard or were lobster fishermen. And it was, it was amazing to work with kids whose real life was deeply connected to lighthouses. At, as I said, each kid gets a book. At the end, one girl said to me, where should I put it? And I said, well, you could put it in your backpack. You can take it home. And she said, but I have to bring it back tomorrow, right? And I said, no, you get to keep it. And she said, forever. And I said, yes, forever. And she said, I'm going to read it every night for the rest of my life. <laughs> And I said, I hope you get some more books. But um, we laid lighthouses together. And then just two days ago, I got back from two weeks in China on a book tour with Hello Lighthouse, which was as different as you might expect to being in tiny islands in Maine. But two stories came out of this trip in China. One was a woman came up to me, and she was at the very end, and she said, I don't have a book. We had a translator. And she said, but I want to tell you that this book helps me see that there's light in the darkness, because I see a lot of darkness in my life. But this reminds me that sometimes there's light and to remember to look for it, which kind of made my knees buckle. And then another young man came up to me, and he said, that he had left the village where he lived to come to the big city. And picture books are kind of new-ish in China. I had many parents ask me, how do I read this book to my child? This young man said, I came from the village, I left my parents, but I'm going to send them this book. They can't read, but they will look at the pictures and they will know the thing that I can't say in words, which is that I am the lighthouse and they are my keepers. And even though they, I, we have been separated, I will always be shining my light back towards them, which again was, was incredibly moving and one of the joys of making a picture book that goes out into the world and has unexpected results. And you hear these things from children and from grown-ups. We don't need lighthouses anymore the way we used to. They used to be almost like paramedics or firemen, lighthouse keepers. But we still have the lighthouses themselves, and I think they are a symbol of all of those things. But even more important, we have books. And we have books into which we can escape to other worlds and perhaps find calmer or safer or more joyous worlds than the one that we're living in right now. And we have five minutes left. That was a gallop. Thank you for staying with me. I hope you have some questions. <laughs> oh, yes, excellent. All right. I'm putting my glasses on so I can see you all the better. You're very sparkly. Yes, what is your question? Where did I get the idea for Ivy and Bean? I got the idea for Ivy and Bean from Annie Barrows, who is the author of Ivy and Bean, and one of my very best friends. And she is one of the funniest people I know. And I can't take any credit for the idea because it was all her idea. And I just got to bring it to life in pictures. Right behind you, yes. What was it like to work with Annie Barrows? It was too much fun. For the first three books, they wouldn't let us even meet each other because they knew it would be like the kids who are not allowed to sit next to each other in class. Have you ever had that experience? It would be like that. So they pretended that they didn't. I'd say, can I talk to Annie? Oh, we don't know her address. You know, Sorry. I mean, we'd let you know, but no. And then we found each other because you know we're smart like that. It's fantastic. It's a lot of fun. Yes. How does the Chinese ink work? The big block is a stone. The skinny one is a stick. It's dry and hard. And it doesn't do anything until you dip it in water. And then you grind it on the, on the rectangle. And it turns into ink like magic. And it's really fun. 
I don't paint with it in a traditional way like calligraphers do. I use it more like watercolour. Yes? Tell us, tell us how it feels to win the Caldecott. It feels... Um, it feels... <laughs> See, I don't have words. Even after all this time, I don't really have words. It's something that you never expect to happen to you once, let alone twice. Um, it's, it's an amazing thing. And I go days and weeks and months without thinking about it and then I kind of remember like oh, this amazing thing happened and then I have to kind of forget about it again because if I look at it too closely it might evaporate I might wake up from a dream and your books will always be in the library thank you thank you yes oh are we gonna alternate we're gonna alternate I will come back to you yes what's your favorite lighthouse oh my favorite lighthouse it would be a tie between the one I got to stay in on the island called Quirpon Island in Newfoundland where nine children were born. Can you imagine that? Not just one, but nine in that lighthouse. That was really fun because I got to see whales and icebergs and we got to go out in a canoe and fish a little bit of iceberg out of the sea. That was really cool. And then we put it in our drink and it kind of exploded and fizzed and they were 10,000 year old air bubbles. And then the other one is Minot's Ledge with the, with the big wave that I showed you. It's a very good question. Yes. What's your favorite book that you made? Favorite book that I made, I think, is Hello Lighthouse. And also, maybe the one that I've just finished working on. I like that one, too. That's not out yet. Mm. Um, yes. Oh, no, we're doing alternate. I'm not very good at this. <laughs> Hello. Oh, one minute, quick. How, yes. how did you get involved with UNICEF to spread the joy of reading around the world? And double, double question, why do you feel it's important for all kids to have books in their hands? Mm. Great question. I was incredibly fortunate that UNICEF came to me and it was actually for a project on uh, measles, measles, measles vaccination. It was uh, immunization campaigns that I went originally with UNICEF and then it turned into literacy campaigns. Um, all of the reasons for reading, we know them all, and yet they cannot be stated enough that a child who reads will grow on to become an adult who reads, and adults who read are more likely to have rewarding and fulfilling lives in their communities. All of the data is there, but also it's just reading promotes curiosity. Screens are passive, they do everything for you, whereas a re reading a book allows you to use your imagination. Kids, you can, you can picture things yourselves, makes your brains work in a different way. It's just all together better, I think. Last one, last one, wrap it up, yes! Um, I was drawing so many connections to your work and Brian Selznick's work as you oh. talked and your pictures, have you worked with him? I have not, but he is a friend and I admire his books very much and so that is an incredibly flattering thing to say and thank you. And I'm going to be signing at 1.30 and if you have more questions for me then I would love to try and answer them. Thank you all so much.